How's it going, everybody? Brian Elvers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio. It is October 1st, 2019, figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. It is already October. Future is upon us. The first day of the first week of the rest of our lives for the time being. Raw tonight, AWNXT on Wednesday, SmackDown on Friday on Fox. What about, what about, what about, what about your daughter? Oh man, this night. And not only do we have a newborn who yes. is not sleeping at all, but then Paisley's gotten sick. And so she was up coughing all night. And I watched Raw. So it's been quite a last few so hours now how do you how do you pronounce your, your daughter's name? Not Paisley. I already know how to pronounce her name. Hanale. Hanale. Okay, yeah. so like, um, like that's like Puff the Magic Dragon, Hanale? Basically, yes. Okay. Yes. Because I read that, and it was, that was like, is that where that came from? Well, it's from, there's a place in Hawaii called Hanalei. Okay. Which is where the song got the word Hanalei. Yeah, so, it, so essentially it's it. the same thing. Basically, yes. Okay, so it's named after this, this Puff the Magic Dragon well, place. Well, named after the place, yes. Yeah, okay, all right. Yes, okay. less so the song. Okay. But yeah, she's as cute as can be. We're just slowly waiting for her to start sleeping. <laughs> yeah it's gonna be a while yeah i don't I'm, I'm slowly i'm slowly waiting to start sleeping myself well you will sleep when you're dead she will sleep when she's six yeah. months old that's my plan oh, okay yeah there's so much stuff going on this week it is freaking incredible this is the biggest week i'm trying to think i think this is the biggest week in the wrestling industry since 2007 oh the chris benoit deal yeah, yeah, because that, that was way bigger than this. Sure. But aside I, from tragedies, I, I, this is the biggest week since 2001. Um, yeah, I would say, would, would you say the, the week that WCW died? Yes. Yeah, ramifications-wise, I would say that's probably right. I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I mean, there's, like, big stories, like, you know, you know, like shocking deaths like you know i mean loads of them but as far as like long-term ramifications uh, i think that this is the biggest yeah yeah i mean you know i mean there's been so many tragedies well i mean there have been tragedies and stuff like that but like this is the first time since we have been doing this that we've totally had to try to figure out what we're going to do as far as everything because of this week Oh, I mean, just like, ah, it's just, it's just crazy because I'm trying to figure out my schedule and it's just like, I'm putting things into place pieces and it's like, nothing's fitting. No, you've had to move the observer. We got to figure out radio shows. I've already revamped three radio shows now to cover different things. I mean, it's like, there's, I don't remember any time that we've ever been doing this website where we've had to do so many shuffling around of various things to try to make everything work. Yeah. And it's, it's completely impossible too. Of course. Yeah. We're going to do our so best. I, because because I'm bound and determined to start riding my bike again. And I don't know when this is going to happen. But I have to. I mean, that's just the reality. So so I don't know what... Oh, man, it's this tough. Because, like, last week was tough because, you know, the Battle of Los Angeles really wore me out. I mean, it's like I knew it would. And I think... You know, you know how that week went. I mean, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't have been. It was going to be impossible no matter what. But then, um, you know, I had a computer breakdown that killed like several hours for one day, and then we had all these blackouts on my the day I was supposed to finish, and still I got it done um, on time, so to speak. But man, was I wiped out on on Friday? It was like, and then it's just like. Usually, like, I'm, I'm kind of wiped out on Thursday, so I can kind of rest on Thursday, and then Friday I'm back. But it's kind of like, when I woke up on Friday, it's like, man, this week was so hard. I'm wiped out. And it's like, but I got to start getting getting work done, because it's Friday already, and I got a pay-per-view. And, and, and an anniversary show, which I didn't end up seeing still, which I can, from what I understand, I can live without seeing, but I think I'm, gonna, I'm still going to try. And, um, yeah, every weekend, like this weekend, there's... um. The UFC. Well, this weekend's not so bad. I mean, there's just really just the UFC on Saturday, and which is normal Saturday, and then there's uh, you know the WWE on Sunday. Which, by the way, by the way, you know that um, there's like no card for Sunday. 
For Hell in a Cell? I guess there isn't. There's, they, they did nothing to, to um, promote any new matches. We know the three matches. And I asked, like, what's going on for Hell in a Cell? And it's like, there's a good card planned if once, you know, like type of a thing, but it's like... They, this reminds it, me of the last time Paul Heyman was in charge of something. We had a pay-per-view with two matches. You remember that ECW pay-per-view? Yes. The, the one in December where... That the, was the, the end of his run. Yeah, well... But I remember this, the afternoon of the show, there was one match announced. We were trying to figure out what the rest of the matches were. It literally yeah, well, was like one match. Yeah, but that but this is this is this is still Vince McMahon. This this isn't I mean Paul Heyman is in fact pretty much I don't say in charge of Raw, but he has a lot of power in Raw. But the idea is is that you have a pay per view card and then you put your TVs together to build that. But they're putting their TVs together for um you know, for Friday really. I mean everything's about Friday. There's a little bit about I mean, they've already advertised a bigger match for um Crown, oh, whatever it is. What do they call Crown Jewel this time? Halloween Havoc? I mean, Actually, I, I think know. it's just Crown Jewel again. Oh, man. Whatever. So they already, they, they, they pushed that match, you know, the Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair managing five-on-five five match. Don't even get me started on that after tonight. Oh, my God. So then, um, what an end of the show. But, uh, yeah, but it's like, the, yeah, there's nothing, I mean... They came out of that pay-per-view, the last pay-per-view, with these three matches. I mean, because I knew them. Like, the minute that pay-per-view was over, I had already figured them out, and they were right. And then, um, but nothing else. And there's still, we, we, we just did the go-home show, and there was no go-home whatsoever because they got bigger fish to fry, you know, Friday. I mean, I guess one of the things is, is like the, um, the WWE Championship match, uh, if Brock wins the title, and it certainly seems that they want us to believe that to be the case, and it probably is the case. Um, you know, obviously they can't do anything with Kofi, you know, because you can't, so it's going to be Brock. Maybe it's Brock and Kofi rematch. Um, but they haven't even announced Brock for Sacramento, which is, you know, you would think you would at least do that. Sacramento has no tickets sold or not. I should say none, but it's, it's a weak advance. And, um, I'm trying to think what else. Yeah. The, um, yeah, it's pretty much it. So, Hopefully on Friday, but you know, this Friday, they're going to have 42 celebrities and a two hour show and all those matches announced. So I don't know what, you know, how much they're going to be able to build up as far as the pay-per-view goes. And uh, to be quite honest, the pay-per-view is, you know, of all the shows this week, the pay-per-view is the least important show. I mean, it's like almost like a, it's almost like something like where it's like, you know, I almost think that they should just skip the freaking pay-per-view because it's well they're not going to skip the pay-per-view yeah well i know that well let's talk about this raw show this go home show for i guess friday i think well, that's what's talk, going let's, on here let's, let's 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 get the news real quick too so 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 Dwayne is on sunday or on friday i should say he is coming in they announced it today so i think that adds quite a few viewers they're going to do a, a giant rating on friday and also i think that Fox has done a tremendous job of promoting Friday's show. And then um, the other big story, I guess, is that uh, uh, TNT closed the deal with TSN at the last minute, or AEW. Well, TNT and AEW both did. So um, so um, Dynamite will be live on one of the TSN channels on Wednesday going forward. I don't know about any replays. But the, um, and then the first, or not the first, I guess the second AEW show on TNT is tomorrow because they actually had the one, um, that Friday show a couple weeks ago. So the preview show is Tuesday. Um, the, let's see, they had the, 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 um, the SmackDown preview show aired Friday and it did, about 1.3 million viewers. So the number actually comes out tomorrow. Um, but that was like on the Fast National, so number in that range, which is neither here nor there. I don't know what that really means. Actually, but, that's a shockingly good number because I totally forgot there was a SmackDown preview show. Well, for, for a Friday night on Fox, it's... That's a good sign, actually. I wouldn't call it a good sign or a bad sign. It's just what it is. Um, it doesn't really... You know, I don't think it really relates one way or the other. But I mean, I think that the... The um, yeah, I, th I think they're going to do a big number on Friday, and then Wednesday, 
no clue. No clue how that's going to turn out. Um, we'll just have to wait and see. But, um, yeah, they had, uh, no, I'm, I don't know. I haven't, I, I don't feel a big buzz. I mean, it's like, I think that AEW has done a great job on Twitter building up the show. But that's already to the, you know, Twitter like builds you up to the audience that, you're, that already knows you. Um, I mean, one of the things I was out uh, on Sunday last night with, you know, my son and, and everything. And we were talking about the thing. And, you know, like he, he they're aware AEW is going on TN, TNT, his friends and everything. But they didn't, they were not aware it was this Wednesday. Like there's a vague awareness. And there was no real like, you know, and don't get me wrong. They don't watch any wrestling anyway, but there wasn't like anything like that. Any of him or his friends are going to be watching that show, you know, so I didn't. And, and they have an awareness of it. Cause the only time I really think that, uh, that they really talked to me about AEW was, um, when the Chicago tickets went on sale and they turned all those people away and they, they, they all knew that it's like, then it was like, Oh man, you hear the sell out and how many people they turned away. So that was, that was like AEW buzz was really big then, but it's got to be really big. And I didn't, um, yeah, there wasn't really that, that thing. I mean, like they, like I said, like they knew that there was a show coming, but they didn't know it was Wednesday. So I didn't take that as a good sign. Well, we'll see what happens Wednesday. We'll be covering it. I still say between 8.50 and 1.2 for both shows, but don't really want to predict much about AEW because that was the that's the one I'm always wrong about. So yeah, maybe no, finally I'll be right. I mean that feels right. I've had people in the TV industry tell me that we're high on that number. Yeah, you've also had people think it's going to beat Raw. That was people. Um, that's people on this website. Yeah, when we did the the last show, the one you weren't at, and I would say it was close to half the people were saying that that. Um, but then again, there was a lot more momentum then. But there, there, were, there were people who thought it would beat Raw this week, which, you know... I, I That's also a very hardcore audience. Yeah, but I just thought, like, there's no way it's going to beat Raw in week one. I mean, there's there were people who thought it would beat SmackDown. And there's I said, like, there's no, no. way... Sma SmackDown's going to be the highest rated show this week by far. I mean, it won't even be close. I know there's no way around that. Um, but um, the Wednesday, as far as who wins on Wednesday, there's, there's you know... I mean, everything, every logical thing says between the head start and just the fact that they've loaded up the show and that WWE promoted it. Although I will say this, I did not think WWE promoted Wednesday all that well tonight. Um, you know, I mean, there was the Street Profits interview. And aside from that, and there were a couple of commercials, but I did not uh, come off of the show, watching the show tonight, as far as which, you know, being excited about Wednesday, nothing at all. Um, it was all about Friday. Um, so, you know, I don't know what that means. I mean, they, they've spent two weeks basically building up this show, but, um, I did think that they would push, push it harder on raw this week when, and, but they had so much stuff on raw that, um, it just wasn't, you know, wasn't the priority. And one other AEW note, they've signed a multi-year deal with hot topic. So stuff's going to be back in hot topic starting this coming month. Starting uh, Wednesday, it's supposed to debut at all the stores on Wednesday, every hot topic in North America. So we'll see how it does. Um, you know, I mean, the, the original Bullet Club stuff, like for a while, for like the first whatever it was, six months, sold like freaking crazy. So, um, but yeah, it was, it's just, it was a different environment. Um, you know, because I mean, those... the. Well, we'll see how well that they, because the, the, to me, the key to their, their stuff, as far as um, when the Young Buck stuff was really selling, was when they were rolling out all these cute t-shirt ideas, and they were always on the internet with new, new t-shirt ideas and stuff. So I think that that's kind of the key, is, um, is that kind of stuff. I don't know, you know, as far as AEW and everything like that. Um, I mean, I've seen, you know, you watch the show, you see some of the stuff. I haven't seen a ton of, I haven't seen much AEW merchandise around when I go out. I see Bullet Club stuff still all the time. I mean, like, even just like last night when I was out, we went um, a couple places and I saw at the mall and at, um, we went to a bowling alley and um, I saw Bullet Club stuff, you know, I saw Bullet Club stuff at, at both places. So it's still around, but, but not, 
I, I don't think I've ever seen an AEW thing. I shouldn't say that. I have, but but rarely. I mean, outside of um, you know, going to a wrestling show, and even like the wrestling shows I go to, um, I can't. Like I was at PWG. Was there anyone wearing AEW stuff? There may have been, but it doesn't ring a belt in my head. You know, most of the stuff that uh, I'm trying to think with. I don't even. I I didn't even really recognize any pre- pre- preponderance of anything at PWG as far as. As far as like, you know, wrestling gear, like it used to be like everybody was wearing wrestling t-shirts and um, I didn't really notice a lot, um, you know, and I guess PWG, it's often a lot of Japanese stuff, but I didn't really notice a lot this time. But then again, for those people, they probably, you know, the people that go to Japan usually go in January, although some, some went in August, you know, for G1, so I don't know. Anyway, all right. Let's get to uh, Raw. talk about Raw. What did you think of this show? It was a very interesting show. I thought that the um, I thought the beginning segment was really good. I thought the ending segment was really good. Um, not necessarily the the Bobby Lashley Lana stuff, which was interesting. That's definitely a Paul Heyman thing. I shouldn't say definitely because I don't know for sure, but I you know that had Paul problems. Heyman sure is into these marital problems. He's in. Uh, yeah, no kidding. Yeah, um, well, you know why? Think about this, okay? He's he's into stuff that relates to his life, and Paul Heyman, I am gonna, I I am going to strongly guess, is probably someone who has because he has a lot of friends, and a lot of his friends had a lot of marital problems since a lot of them are in wrestling. So therefore, I think that that's kind of like where he, you know, it's that's where he he scripts stuff. You're, you know, Kevin Sullivan used to do that too. Where where there was a preponderance of um, storylines where, you know, the 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 woman kind of screws the guy. You know, the guy's kind of the innocent one, and the woman just screws the guy. And I kind of see that in this one because, like, in this Rusev Lana thing, it's the guy who's the sympathetic one, not the woman. Um, in Mike and Maria, I mean, it's sort of the same thing, although I'm although you really can't have sympathy for either of them. But Maria is more of the bitch than Mike, so we are getting kind of um, we do we we do that is kind of a thing. So I guess it's soap opera for guys with the idea that um, you know, in the end, you know, you. Uh, you date the hot girl, and she's going to screw you in the end, which, in in a sense, um, yeah, I think that I think that that's kind of like our uh, our thing. So the the one thing on the Raw show that just, um, even though I mean you can say that there was an explanation that deal where where Rusev saves Seth Rollins and then cuts a heel promo on him like a minute later was just, and he's still teaming with him. That, that was. Um, I don't even know what to say about that. It was just kind of like, uh, my, it's too much for me. I, I, I just want my storylines a lot more consistent than, you know, these guys are a tag team, and then, but, but they're also cutting promos on each other. But there you go. We've got a brand new open, new song, new video package, the whole nine yards. We had Pyro. We had a you brand know, new set. I did think that, that the, the very open was very cool. Yeah, the set cool. is awesome. It's this giant video half pipe. Should have hired, uh, what's his name from AEW, the skateboarder. Should have hired Darby him. Darby Allen. Darby Allen. He should have gone down that thing. He signed in the wrong place. They had this <laughs> great video package, the pyro, everybody's going crazy. Dio Man, Jerry Lawler, Vic Joseph for the new announced team. So, so, so what do you think? Well, this is what I thought watching the show. It was about midway through. And I'm listening to Vic Joseph call some spot or something like that. It suddenly hit me. I've been watching Raw for 90 minutes, and not once has Michael Cole just been screaming at me. It was great. Like I thought- it's not the best announced team in the in the world, but they're so much better. Nobody was offensive to me. Lawler's fine in his role. Vic Joseph is very good. Dio Man didn't have a lot to say, but he didn't say anything that was like stupid which we hear like most of the time with some well, of these now, third okay so, so 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 now now you're like comparing him to coach or renee that's yes not, what do you want me to do that's I what i have you, to compare wwe announcers to other wwe announcers and they're yeah. way better than every other crew so far 
No, they're not better than the they're not better than the two hundred five live crew. We're not they're talking not about two hundred five live. I'm talking about Ron Smackdown. I mean, I mean Smack. I mean the NXT crew. I don't even know who the two hundred five live crew is now. That I think about it, because Vic Joseph was okay. So I thought Vic Joseph was fine. I didn't think that he was. Um, I didn't think that he was particularly good or bad, but I thought he was fine. I thought Jerry Lawler was really good. Um, I thought he completely stole the show. He has uh, the last two times he's been on as well. Yeah, I thought he completely stole the show, which is funny because he's the one who's not supposed to be long term. And when it was over, it was kind of like he's so much better than these other guys. Deal Madden, it was was very nervous, and um, it was his. You know, it's not his first show because he has done. Um, they did try him out on two hundred five live a couple times. Um, he's getting his sea legs together. You know, I mean, he he may or may not end up being good. I do think that he was much better than. Um, David Otunga, when David Otunga started, but again, I'm now pretty I'm pretty sure comparing. he's better than David Otunga now. Yeah, I'm still so we still I'm still comparing also to a low bar, but um, yeah, but it's a WWE show. Like that's who we have to compare the announcers to. We can't compare the announcers to like great announcers in other promotions or in other eras. Like what we're comparing it to right now is what we had before, and this is better. I guess it couldn't hold a candle to Kevin Kelly and Rocky. Well, no, but we're not watching New Japan. We're watching Raw, and we had a horrible announced team, and now we've got a decent well, announced no, team. Well, whoa, 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 whoa. Well, but that horrible announced team is going to be there on Friday. If yeah, you I know. Horrible. I know. It's, that, that's the Friday team, and that's the team Fox wanted. I know. I mean, this, you know, you know, I don't I know mean, what's going on with these people. Okay, because because you know, Fox is a lot more hands on than than USA. Just for people, and I don't know if people know that, but there's there, um, you know, before USA kind of let Vince do whatever. I mean, Fox. The Fox people are very much studying pro wrestling. They're very much into this pro well, they wrestling. They're studying thing. it that hard if that's the announced team they wanted. That's the announced team. Yeah, they wanted the A announced team, and the A announced team's Michael Cole. He's been the A announcer for, you know, God knows how long. Hmm. But, well, they uh, need to study harder. Yeah, well, yeah, it ain't going to be Moro because that, that wasn't going to work. Um you know, even though God, Moro was freaking, you know, Moro was great on the Bellator show on on last Saturday night, um, for whatever that's worth. Uh, but yeah, so that's what I kind of thought. the The announcing, yeah, it, it's it's better. I mean, Deal Madden's a, a work in progress, but um, King was really strong, much stronger than I expected. So he was he was on. He was he was funny. I mean, when was the last time? A raw announcer was funny. I mean, it's like Corey Graves. It's the last time Jerry Lawler was there. Yeah, Corey Graves at times has some good snappy remarks at times, but I would never call him like really um, funny. I mean, Lawler was was you know he just throws these one liners like he did when he was like you know uh, you know um, when he was wrestling in Memphis. He just throws these out, and and I mean they were they weren't even like copies of the ones he used to do because like. When Lawler was at the working with Jr. at the end, and he went even after Jr., I would. I, Lawler was then he was he was kind of phoning it in in a lot of ways because I would listen to him and be like, oh, you know, I mean, all the lines would be the lines that he was doing when he was on Memphis TV, you know, doing his promos. But this was like a lot of new stuff. So, um, but he was, yeah, he was getting over everything. I mean, he was he was aggressive. The other guys were kind of left behind. He was trying, but he was very strong at getting over the angles when it, when when. Um, you know, just in his, you know, because obviously with his, you know, 45 or whatever, let me see how many, how many years, 49 years in the wrestling business, you and, and, and at the top level and, you know, being an all-time great talker, you develop a lot of tremendous instincts, you know, when it comes to being able to sell and get angles over. And um, he was very strong at that. Ray comes out in his street clothes, cuts a promo about the main event. Dominic's in the front row. He says it's because of him. It's because of you, Dominic, that I'm getting this match tonight. I owe it all to you. I vow to bring this championship home. And suddenly, Brock Lesnar's music hits. And Lesnar and Heyman come out on the ramp. They get in the ring. Ray tries to yank the mic out of Paul's hand. So Brock grabs him, flattens him with two F5s. Dominic in the front row stands up, but he's terrified. Brock gets out of the ring, stares him down. Dominic sits down, doesn't want trouble, but he's made himself trouble. Brock grabs him. Yanks him over the barricade, slams him into the post, slams him on the ground. Dominic actually did great bumps, sold great. Well, the one time, that one time, though, Lesnar almost lost him on the first slam. But he got him up because he's Brock. Well, because he's Brock. Yeah, he's super strong, yeah. 
Ray tried to make the save. Brock grabbed him, gave him another F5. Brock starts to leave, but then he turns around, goes back, takes them both to Suplex City. Yeah, it was sad to see nobody out there to save Ray Mysterio, the great legendary Hall of Famer Ray Mysterio. Instead, they sent out Fit Finley and another dude. Brock goes yeah, back and destroys them. And yeah, where was where was where was Ricochet? Where was anybody? Nobody came out to save these guys. Anyway, this segment was awesome. There's nobody like Brock Lesnar. Yeah, he's just great. a monster. He's great. They showed a clip during the break of Dominic being stretchered out with the neck brace on. Ray was going with him. They made it very clear that Ray Mysterio is not getting his match tonight. That they built up now for two weeks. Mm-hmm. I didn't like that, but that's what they did. Yeah. So they also when 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 he went into the into the um, ambulance. Oh, it was really interesting too. Is they they played the ambulance siren during the first match, which is a little touch that would never be done. I thought that was very interesting. I mean, not. I thought I, I, it was actually pretty cool because uh, the first one I heard, I thought oh, someone's coming out. It's like no, it was the ambulance taking Dominic to the hospital. And the other one was is when they went into the when he, when when Ray went into the uh, ambulance, he took his mask off, which was not called attention to at all, but he did which I thought was interesting, too. I think that was the idea of, of trying to sell it as being serious and real and that the uh, playtime, you know, pro wrestling time, is over. So that was uh, just an interesting little twist. I don't think anyone even picked up on it. but um, Nope. But that was like the idea. Sasha Banks versus Alexa Bliss. Becky Lynch doing commentary. This was a total nothing match. Becky gets on the table. She's yelling at Sasha. They go to commercial. They come back. She's still standing there. Sasha pretends to call for Bailey, which distracts Alexa. Sasha rolls her up. Pins her using the tights. I think we saw like two minutes of this match, maybe. And then Becky runs down, attacks Sasha. Sasha bails into the crowd. And Becky cuts a promo on her, saying that Sasha made it personal. She's going to make it painful. And a retribution is coming. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, we, that's we got a match for the ma- pay-per-view. That's, that's one. one our, that's one of our three matches, yeah. They announced Rock is coming to SmackDown on Friday. Charlie interviews Seth Rollins. Seth says, I know you're going to ask about Hell in a Cell, but all I can think about is what Brock did to Ray and Dominic. I'm disgusted by it. What, 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 was, what did he do? He beat up Ray and Dominic. No, no, I mean, what did Seth do? Well, he says his title means as much to me as anything. I work too hard for it. And at Hell in a Cell, I'm going to prevail and walk out as champion. And since Ray can't compete tonight, I'm going to be giving the fans the championship match that was promised. Anybody who wants to accept can accept, and I'll burn it down. So he shouldn't open challenge. That's what he did. Okay. Heavy Machinery versus Bobby Roode, Dolph Ziggler for the Raw Tag Team titles. Otis no longer wears the top on his singlet. He's just celebrating how fat he is. Fans just go nuts for him every time he gyrates. Oh, so so you know what you know what's funny about about um, Otis is a lot uh, everything that he does. Okay, no, but there was a line Lawler. God, what was the line? It was a line about like never working out. He was he was like saying something like like Otis, which is funny because Otis obviously his whole gimmick is is that he works out. He just eats too much, steaks and weights. Yes, so, but Lawler thought like that. Otis is like this fat guy who never goes to the gym, and that's why he's a, such a fat guy. So I thought that was kind of funny and ironic. But um, the one thing, so before this match, so Rude and Ziggler come out, and you know the thing in WWE, and it's it's on every show. It's not you know, but I keep thinking, man, if I'm in the arena, like Rude and Ziggler come out, they go through a four minute commercial break, then they do a bunch of interviews. And it's like, they're just standing there in the ring with that music playing forever. Actually, no, it's even more bizarre. What happens, because I've seen this many times at these shows, is they come out, and then they turn the lights off, and they shut off the music, and they show everything on the big screen. So these guys are standing there in the dark, unmoving, while they play all of these video packages. Then they play some other random videos during the commercial break. And then when they come back to commercial, the music just picks up randomly in the middle of the song. The lights go on, and the guys have to act like they've been standing there the entire time. Yeah. Imagine sitting through that. That was because that's longer than some of the matches. Yep. Just them standing there. For, yep. like, like, this one was forever for Rude. For, for Rude. So anyway, they do this match, and... 
Uh, Tucker, he'd on him for a while and then gave the hot tag to Otis. He did all of his gyrations. Caterpillar, double elbow. They go for the compactor. Ziggler breaks up with the super kick, sends Otis outside. Rude hits the DDT on Tucker and gets the pin. So heavy machinery, not the Raw Tag Team Champions. Mm -mm. Then we had Miz TV with Flair and Hogan. So Miz comes out and he wishes best wishes to Dominic, while also throwing in a cheap plug about the birth of his own daughter. Introduces both guys. Flair loves Miz's style. Hogan comes out with Jimmy Hart to Real American. Miz says, what, how many what times? Jim, what was Jimmy Hart doing there? He's Hogan's manager. Well, yeah, but... Because they're going to Saudi Arabia, and the prince, I'm sure, wanted to see Hulk Hogan and Jimmy Hart. Yeah, but he, but he, why did he have to be in the in the in the ring in that segment? Well, I'm just saying, like, it's like I know Jimmy Hart. Wherever Hulk Hogan goes, Jimmy Hart goes because that's his guy. Okay, but that doesn't mean he has to follow him to the ring. Well, he did I mean, tonight. Okay, so okay, so, so the, I mean, one of the points is is like Jimmy Hart is like like a great promo when he wants when when he's given the chance. So he's out there and he's just standing there with his jet black hair at seventy plus years old and. All I can think of is just like, give this guy a chance to talk. He's actually quite good at this. And no, he's just standing there for like no reason. I mean, it's like, not not that Hogan and Flair need help in it. And they did give Rick a lot more lines than they usually do because they're usually so scared to death of what he's going to say with a live mic that they don't like him getting a live mic. And Hogan is just like, you know, wind him up and he's going to do the Hulk Hogan promo. I mean, I, you know, these two guys, you know, even at their age, had more charisma than everyone else on the show, which was also kind of a scary thing. I mean, because it was like those two guys cutting these promos, it's like they did make you want to see a freaking match, which nobody else can do. And I mean, like I'm watching this going like they're making me want to see a match that I really badly don't want to see, like badly. Like Hulk Hogan, I don't want to see him break his back, um, and he's looking really old. And Rick, you know, Rick is, is, is 70 years old, and I don't want to see him do another match either. And those people, weren't they chanting one more match? Oh, God. Yep, it's... Miz wanted to know how many times you got to see three legends in the ring. Flair just cuts him off and says, I'm sick of having to hear that music for 30 years. They start cutting promos on each other. And Flair says Hogan may be the biggest draw in WWE history, but in the ring, nobody can touch me. I got no equal in the squared circle. That includes Hulk Hogan. Hogan says, sounds that's, like that's, you want another run with the 24-inch pythons. That's, I mean, Hogan himself acknowledged it at the beginning, saying that Flair was the greatest. So you know, it was interesting is, is Flair, when he was putting over Hogan's drawing power, he just goes, you know, like, nobody drew more than Hulk Hogan, Steve Austin, and The Undertaker. And it's like, The Undertaker? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. I mean, like Hulk Hogan and Steve Austin, yes, without a doubt. But The Undertaker, it's kind of like, is that, and I'm sure that, I mean, I don't know. I mean, Rick, you know, it could be a scripted line. Law, odds are it was a scripted line. But that's just a weird, I guess, is that like WWE mythology that you have to say The Undertaker? Apparently. Andre the Giant's too far back. So anyway, Miz announces, well, first the fans chant one more match, and Hogan says, we're not spring chickens anymore. And Miz says, well, I got a huge announcement. On October 31st, doesn't mention Saudi Arabia, it is going to be Team Hogan versus Team Flair five on five. And Hogan says, well, let's talk about my captain, and out comes Seth Rollins. And then Flair's starting to cut his promo, but Randy Orton comes out before he's even done. He's the captain of Team Flair. And over the next couple of weeks, they're going to pick the rest of their team. And Orton challenges Seth to a captain's match. And that was a segment. It ran long. I will say that Flair looked really old. But man, when it came time to cut that promo, he was 35 years old again. Boy, that guy can cut a promo. And Hogan was, as you noted, wind him up and he's Hulk Hogan. I thought it was fun. You know, when, when you're not, when you only get to see him every now and then... It's, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I thought the segment was really good. I'm, I actually believe this would be the highest rated segment on the show. Probably. Yeah, I would think, I would be surprised, I would be, you know, I'd be surprised if it isn't, because usually, like I've said before, um, the difference between the ratings now and the ratings in every other period since, you know, I, I would see quarters going back to the early 80s is that 
when stars come out, it would go like way up. And when non-stars come out, it would go way down. And now when non-stars are out there, it does go down, but it doesn't go way down. It does drop. But I mean, when stars come out, I mean, it might tick up, you know, like a hundred thousand viewers, but you know, before you'd have guys like, you know, tick up like a half a million viewers or more 600,000 viewers like Austin or Ric Flair or whatever, Dusty Rhodes, whoever it is, right? The, the viewers. Yeah, it's because there's no stars anymore. It's just one giant middle class. Yeah, exactly. But even even like Roman Reigns, you know, it's like, I don't, I you know. He's I know not Seth, a Hogan. He's not a Flair. He's not a, he's not even a John Cena. But like Seth, like the last He's not a Flair. He's not a Hogan. He's not a John Cena. But Seth, Seth for the last couple of weeks has been in the lowest rate segment. And I wouldn't be surprised if he is again tonight. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised at all that the Seth Rusev match would be the lowest rated segment. Well, he faces Randy Orton, but Baron Corbin comes down. He and Orton double team Seth. Rusev makes the save. Him and Rollins clear the ring, and they pose with Hulk Hogan afterwards. So I presume that Rusev is going to be part of Team Hogan. And and Corbin. Yeah, no, no. They pretty much made it clear that Rusev is, is the second guy on Team Hogan, and, and Baron Corbin is the second guy on Team Flair. So then Charlie interviews Rusev, and she says, where's Lana at? And he just stares off into space. And she says, all right, well, what do you want to accomplish here? Like, So you had to ask a stupid question after the good question? He says, well, I'm not here to talk about problems at home. I'm here to talk about problems in the ring. Seth got beaten up. Only one man was there to save him. And now I want to collect on my debt. I want a universal title match tonight. That was his challenge. Yeah. Another AOP promo, then the Viking Raiders versus Anderson and Gallows. Uh, heat on Ivar for a while. Crowd's dead. Eric got that tag. Go to commercial. Come back, get heat on him. And they do their near falls at the end. Ivar hits a tope on Anderson outside, and then they hit the top rope combo splash on Gallows for the pin. It was just a regular top rope splash. It was just yeah. um, um, Ivar did a splash, and um, I think um, I think it was Dio Madden. You said that it's 305 Live, which I thought was kind of a cute line. I appreciate they are not doing 50-50 with these guys. That's good. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So, in theory, um, these guys should be getting a title shot, but um, there was, like, nothing in that direction. No challenge, no nothing. Charlie says that Brock Lesnar is still here, wants to address his actions from earlier. Action, she says, that some people by the are way, the, By the way, you, 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 you missed, you missed um, the AOP interview. Well, they did their interview. There was yeah. nothing to it. It was the same one they've been doing. I don't even remember what they so said. It's a little yeah. bit different, but there's nothing to it. Yeah. So then Ricochet Sasha walks up. No, who was it? Oh. Who walked up? Okay. so I have so, Sarah in my notes, and I know Sarah oh, didn't oh, walk okay, up. So, okay, okay. So Charlie, Charlie Caruso did an interview talking about, or, or was, was out there talking about how Dominic Oh, Cesaro gone. walked Brock's up. Brock's still here. Cesaro came up and said... Um, that there was nothing criminal about what Brock Lesnar did, and he enjoyed it. And um, the only thing criminal is that he stole my opportunity to do the same thing, to beat the crap out of Ray Sun myself. And if they were here, I would do it. And then Ricochet came up and said that, you know, you're eight inches taller than Ray, but you're not half the man he is. How is he eight inches taller than Ray? I think he's 14 inches taller than Ray. It was a tall day for Ray, I guess. I'm not sure. eight, eight, eight inches. Um, yeah. Well, I, I guess, don't think that Cesaro is 5'10". Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So so um, he's way taller than 5'10". So anyway, um, Ricochet challenged him to a match, and then we get the Cesaro-Ricochet match, which, in fact, was very short. They had a very short match, and Ricochet had his huge twisting flip dive early so the announcers could tell us he is a real life superhero this is death branding they need to stop this immediately sorry gave him a backbreaker for the heat worked him over we had to have a random chin lock for some reason because it's a wwe match then ricochet hit a dragon runner for the pin fun wall lasted awesome finish but the match was like three minutes a wwe was no heat. it was WWE just like match it was just bing 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 and it's out and over Got a new Firefly Funhouse. Witch is laughing. The pig is fat. Vulture is short circuiting in the box. Rabbit scared. Didn't the rabbit die? Yeah, Bray came in and the rabbit died. And the survivors tell ha- them. Hasn't the rabbit died before? Like, didn't he eat the rabbit once? I'm pretty sure this rabbit is immortal. Okay. So they explain they're terrified about what the fiend is going to do to Seth in the cell. And Bray says, Well, Hell in a Cell is scary. 
It's like a world without chocolate, but worse. You can enter, but you can never really leave. It's Hotel California. It says the fiend will always protect them. He will come back no matter what, but I don't think Seth Rollins will be so fortunate. And then he says he's going to go, he's going to go tell the fiend to be nice to Seth. That's the end of the segment. I don't think the fiend's going to be nice to Seth. No. AJ versus Cedric Alexander. Uh, another commercial break during the match. Had some good near falls there at the end. AJ avoided the lumbar check, hit a reverse DDT. Cedric with the Michinoku driver. They had some sort of botch. And then finally, Cedric went for the lumbar check again. AJ countered into the Styles Clash, pinned him. AJ retains the title. That's a good match. Yeah. Um, not, not spectacular, but good. Three Profits plugged their Undisputed Era match on Wednesday. And then after weeks of build... So they, we were get, scared, they, they were scared of the fiend they put put over. Yes, they, never they, say they, the fiend's name three times. He will show up. Yeah. Natalia faced Lacey Evans, and they have a short match. The ref goes to pull Natty off. Lacey rakes her eyes. It's a clumsy reverse rolling cradle, gets the pin, and then gives her the women's right afterwards for good measure. Yeah. They said at the end, they called it, the final stamp on the rivalry. So I wonder if that was the mean means that the feud is over. <laughs> That's what that means, but we'll see if it's over. Yeah. It was uh yeah, it was just there. Yeah, it was just there. Heyman promo backstage. Oh, you missed you missed the big the fit ops thing. The what? The fit ops thing. I missed it. What was it? So there's this um there's this charity of um that John Cena is involved in, and he's encouraging people to uh, donate to it, and it's to help uh, veterans uh, get jobs, I guess, and, and uh, get acclimated back into society. They're down on their luck, and he will match all donations up to a million dollars. Wow! Personally. So, so, so That's I was pretty cool. I was very impressed by this because, um, you know, it's one thing like. I mean, if you're like, like, you know, Bill Gates or something and you donate a million dollars, it's, it's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Or even if you're Vince McMahon and do it, it's really not that big of a deal. But the last I heard about John Cena, and this is a couple of years old, but he was, it was when he was going through his divorce. And so that's actually several years ago. But um, at the time, I think he was worth $17 million, which is, you know, I mean, it's like, so donating, I mean, he's, I'm sure he's worth more now. But then again, th with the divorce, I don't know how much he, the, the divorce cost him. But he's also had some big years since then. But um, it's like a million dollars is like a real amount of money to John Cena. So it's like, that's, that's quite impressive. That's um, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Paul Heyman promo apologizes to Ray and Dominic. Says, if you want to blame someone, blame Vince for allowing me to schedule Brock on the Raw season premiere when he's in fight mode. A lot of tough guys in sports, but nobody can do anything about what Brock did. Kofi can thank God for the power of positivity. But this Friday, there will be a new undisputed WWE heavyweight champion. Okay, so that promo, he talked about tough guys and he mentioned mixed martial arts and real fighters and nobody can touch them. That's, that's, that, was, that was a promo for Kane. Now, whether that's going to end up happening... Cain Velasquez, not the mayor. Yes, Cain Velasquez, yeah. In fact, I think that the you know, the whole segment with Ray and everything, it's like you, you beat up the, the Mexican and the Mexican superhero badass comes in. That's kind of where the idea was behind everything. But um, Cain is not signed either. So, um, it's, you know, they... they they have an idea. Uh, obviously, it's Brock and Kane, and these pro you know this stuff was was in that direction, but um, yeah, I mean it may not it may end up not happening, but that is, but that that's the destination in theory that this is headed towards. Charlie with Maria Canellis backstage. She says Rusev is not the father. Clearly, has plenty going on with Lana, and then Sasha shows up. So, and so like everyone knows about their marriage problems. We're, we're supposed to. I didn't know about it. They're, maybe they just happened this weekend and yeah, we they missed just it. made it up here on the spot. Man, where's TMZ when they should be out there with the... But anyway, anyway 
Yeah. Sasha says, I'm going to show Becky Carnage at Hell in a Cell and make her tap out. Mystery Car shows up outside. And then we have Seth Rollins versus Rusev for the Universal title with Orton and Corbin watching on the ramp. So they do a match, and all of a sudden, Bobby Lashley's music hits, and he comes out on the ramp. Rusev is just glaring at him. Lashley then calls out Lana, who comes out on the ramp, starts making out with Lashley. And Lashley's got the biggest grin on his face. Poor Rusev just standing there. They just make out forever. Seth Rollins has vanished, by the way. Then the lights go out. Well, he's, he was laying, laying on the floor waiting for the fiend. Okay, so, okay, so now, now here's the thing. Wouldn't, like, Rusev, like, run out there and, like, try to attack him? He's just so shocked. He can't move. I mean, I just, uh, that that wasn't whatever. So, 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 maybe that 80 English stuff was true after all. I guess we'll find out. Where's Aiden English when we need him, besides doing commentary? He's doing commentary. Yeah, but, like, it's, that, that ended Aiden English's career. So the lights go out, music plays, Fiend shows up, puts Seth in the claw outside. Good news is that because Seth was in the claw, he couldn't just sit there and cry this week. So that was an improvement. And that's the end of the show. And by the way, are you telling me that after making Seth look like a total geek on this show for weeks, he ends up in the lowest rated segment on the show? Is that true? I can't even believe that. Well, he was he was doing that even before. But I do think that there's a pretty good chance that uh, Seth and Rusev could be the... You know, um, 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 Lacey and Natalia could be also. Yes. I mean, that, that would be possible. I wouldn't be surprised that that, that would be the lowest rate segment also because it was, it was so late in the show. And that those kind of segments late in the show, um, it's hard. I don't know how the football game did. It was two zero and three teams. So um, everyone kind of... The kind of feeling was that Raw was going to do, you know, between the football game being a weak game and Hogan and Flair being on the show and just a lot of attention on WWE this week that Raw is probably going to be, I think the ex- expectations are that Raw will be, you know, the highest it's been since football season started. All right, let's do the mailbag here. A lot of questions. Mailbag at WrestlingObserver.com. This person says, a few weeks ago when you were discussing the changes to the WWE writing team, one name I don't remember hearing was Dave Kapoor. Is he still with the company? And if so, yeah. what is his role? Yeah, he's still on the writing team, yeah. This person here says, How does Dave view the Hall of Fame candidacy of Naito as compared to New Japan contemporaries like Ibushi, Ishii, and Omega that are also on this year's ballot? Um, I mean, stronger than Ishii, without a doubt. Um, Ibushi, Naito. Naito's a bigger merch seller. He's a bigger drawing card. Um, Ibushi's the better wrestler of the two. So that's, I would call that one close. And Omega, I would say close as well. I would have them all, um, Omega's, because Omega also had a lot of influence in the U.S. scene with, you know, New Japan being so strong at, at that time. I mean, it's not right now, but at that time, um, especially on those first, those first couple shows. Um, I, they're, 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 they're close. I would, man, that's, that's a tough one. I, Naito's pretty strong. I mean, to me, Naito's a, a realistically, a realistically, all four of them are Hall of Famers. Um, I mean, Naito, whether you vote him in this year or not, at the end of the day, he's already accomplished it. Because, I mean, his drawing level and his merch level are, you know, and work level as well, are all way up there. Omega's work levels way way up there and and just you know some of the things that he's done you know headlined the the first Tokyo Dome sell in 20 years won the G1 incredible matches some of the greatest matches of all time um you know it definitely influenced drawing card in the United States as well um you know I guess if AEW completely doesn't do anything that that would hurt his candidacy since he's one of the flagship stars but um you know He's he's pretty much there. Ibushi to me is no brainer. I mean, he's just so freaking talented. He is a drawing card. 
Um, I think a lot of people aren't going to vote for him because it's he because he looks like he's 25. So it seems like it's too early, but he's actually 38. Um, and his candidacy will probably be stronger at this time of year from now because he'll have headlined one or two Tokyo Dome shows and maybe he had won the IWGP title or if not had a you know phenomenal match and challenging for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think all, you know, Ishii, you know, it was funny when, when I was down in LA, we were talking about Ishii and Ishii is a completely unique, there's never been anyone like Ishii because there's never been someone who is so good and, and re relatively over who is that I can ever think of who's gotten less as far as, you know, like no IWGP title and probably will never get it. Not even an intercontinental title. Um, you know, it's like never, never main, I mean, main event house shows, you know, or main event G1 shows, but he's never main evented, um, like a sumo hall show. I don't think, um, maybe, maybe he did. I'm trying to think. I mean, he has gotten a few IWGP title matches because he had the, um, the match with um, Omega when he after he beat Omega in the G one he got a title match there. He did main event the the, the Long Beach U S Championship thing with with Omega as well, but that was that that's that wasn't a big arena main event. Um, he'll never main event at Tokyo Dome most likely. Um, so it's 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 an interesting case, but he's one of the best wrestlers I've ever seen in my life, and on a and he's very you know um, it's like, and he always has a good match. I mean, it's not like it's some guy who. Um, you know, may have a great match, like a Randy Savage who may have like this great, great match, but you know, most of the, you know, it's like hitting really hit and miss and can really have some bad ones too. Um, I mean, and most, most guys are like that. Even, even as great as Ric Flair was and, and granted Ric Flair was doing 300 matches a year, but, um, and, and Ishii's not doing that many singles matches. So it's probably a completely unfair comparison, but I mean, Ishii, when he's given a singles match, even against you know, guys that aren't necessarily that good. Like he just, it's always good. He just does not have bad matches. So and they're all, they're all, they're all strong. There are none. I, I don't know that any of them go in this year, but I think that in due time, every one of them is probably someone who should be in, I think. This person here says, with the NBA season starting back up in a few weeks, how do you think it will affect the ratings for AEW, NXT, and SmackDown, being that the NBA broadcasts games on both Wednesdays and Fridays on ESPN? Yeah, it'll affect it. NBA, NBA, um, strong NBA game always affects um, wrestling ratings. We've seen that for years and years and years, um, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, late in the season um, or mar marquee teams late in the season, play, you know, deep in the playoffs, then it'll hurt a lot. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. This person wants to know if Barrios and Wilson are the real business geniuses in WWE. Um, it's an interesting question. So um, they're very, very smart, uh, both of them. Uh, they, they, they've definitely made a lot of strong moves. Uh, they're the ones who are very much, uh, you know, Michelle Wilson was really one of the strong ones in pushing the network idea and getting Vince to dump pay-per-view. I don't know if that's like, um, I don't know if that's like, you know, I mean, in, in a sense, like the network dumping the pay-per-view in the case of like eight, eight of the 12 pay-per-views a year, without a doubt, and with, with the benefit of hindsight, that was a good move for the other four. I think it probably was not. And for WrestleMania, it absolutely was a bad move. But um, still, the network idea has been generally, a, I mean, it hasn't been, it hasn't been anywhere close to as successful as they were expecting, but I would still call it a success. Um, you know, as far as like, you know, um, um, changing the face of the company to where, they're more open as far as, you know, more um, sponsors are willing to come on and things like that. You know, I think that a lot of that's her. Um, you know, Barrios is a, you know, very much of a numbers guy and everything like that. I mean, you know, I, I, it's, it's, I can't, it's hard for me to say with Barrios, but with Michelle Wilson, 
Yeah, I think so. I think so. She's one of the real key business uh, geniuses. Absolutely. This person wants to know why it said 17-time champion when Rick came out for Ms. TV. Um, maybe it's in, who knows? They, they That's just, weird. They changed the number. Hey, look, the real number's probably 20. You can't just change that number. They've been using that number on WWE TV since 2001. The real number's 20. I know right. that. Or, or like, you could even say, you, how do you change history that you've done for 19 years by just like saying, oh, now he's 17? WWE does that all the time. No. Just make stuff up as they go. No, because they had that whole thing about how John Cena was going to tie when he got his 16th world title. Like, this has been such a major part of their history. It's like one day out of the blue just going, hey, WrestleMania 3 did uh, 77,000 people. They would never do that. That's true. Though. That's well, their true. history. Yeah, well, they change their history all the time, though. Dave, you're right, but this is a big one. Not you know how many stories me. they've told about Ric Flair and his 16 world titles and 16-time world champion and people tying the record and Triple H know, and I John know, Cena? Know. Now I you're know. just going to all of a sudden say it's 17? That's ridiculous. Baseball did that. Well, you know what? They didn't... Because Babe Ruth had 715 home runs, okay? But he was always credited with 714. But then, like, they did research and they found it was 715. And I think that baseball just said, well, I think that they... May have I'm I'm trying to remember because there was a big controversy about I'm going to guess about 40 years ago maybe 45 years ago when they found the 715th home run and I don't even remember I, I'd have to look in a record book to see I think they still just call it 714 because they did for so many years so um so and actually that would be that would be an argument uh, in favor of the fact that they used fake history which baseball has done as well um. And to override the real history when the discovery was made. So anyway, that's, um, I don't know. They just did. It's WWE. What are you going to say? You know, they they changed Bruno San Martino's uh, fake number of mass square and sellouts. Although I guess that their reason was because he sold out the, uh, the Hall of Fame ceremony. That's his 188th, even though that's a completely ridiculous number. He didn't even wrestle 188 times in mass square garden in his whole life. He wrestled about... I think maybe 140, and a lot of them weren't sold out. A lot, a lot. As far as I want to know what happened with Kawato, he vanished. I asked that question many times, and I have never gotten an answer. So I do not have an answer for you, but I have, in fact, asked that question. Wow. All right, everybody, on that note, we're going to wrap it up for today. There's going to be plenty to talk about this week, so fear not. We're going to be back a thousand times with a thousand shows. New Observer is going to be out on Thursday. That's the new day for The Observer. Back issues up on the front page right now. And that is it. We'll talk to you again after a while.